everyone. I'm Jess and I'm the content manager here at Course Report. Course Report is the resource for helping people find the right coding boot camps for them. You can use the Course Report website to research the best coding boot camps all over the world, as well as insights on which coding languages to learn, where to apply, and how to break down all of that coding boot camp jargon and so much more. Today, I'm speaking with a data science bootcamp alum from Flatiron School. One of the trademarks of a bootcamp is that students usually build some sort of capstone or final project. And so this bootcamp grad is going to walk us through their capstone project. But first, let me introduce them. Lavender Zhang had a background in urban infrastructure engineering before upskilling her career with the online data science bootcamp at Flatiron School this year. So Lavender, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Um, you graduated from Flatiron School's data science bootcamp this year, which means you were recently working on a very cool capstone project. But first, I'd like to hear a bit more about your online bootcamp experience. There's so many online data science bootcamps out there now. So what stood out about Flatiron School? Thank you so much, Jess, for inviting me to be interviewed by Course Report. So um, that is a very good question that you ask. Uh, when I finished my graduate degree at NYU, um, I stepped into the energy industry uh, based on my previous experiences as well as my personal interest. And while I work at my current job, I realized that I'm really into advancing my skills in data science. And I've been looking everywhere through doing online research, as well as reading blogs about different types of book camp. And, um, but Flatiron was actually a program that one of my colleagues in, um, mentioned to me, recommended. Well, she completed the software development program, but my interest was more on the data science. And she did say, yes, Flatiron does offer a data science um, option for, for students who are interested. So I went to look it up and um, then we enter into the pandemic period. Um, I actually pick up my phone and called quite a lot of bootcamp programs uh, in, within New York City or generally within the United States and Canada. Um, after speaking to many different admission officers, I feel like Flatiron program, the admission officer, the team was very strong. They give you a really great overview of the general course material, the content, uh, as well as the layout of the entire curriculum. Plus, Flatiron also offers a great um, support on the career development side. So I feel very confident and strong after talking to them and make my final decision of enroll in Flatiron. Plus, um, my colleague who attended the software engineering program really gave good words about the school. So that also helped me making the decision. You have a STEM background, as in you went to college for STEM fields. So what's the difference between learning at an online data science boot camp like Flatiron School versus actually learning data science at some kind of college or university program? Um, so I, um, when I finished my master at NYU in urban structure, urban infrastructure engineering, I, within the time period I was at NYU, I did got into really interested in coding. So I did take classes either from the electrical or the data science school in order to boost up my skills. But because I didn't really have a strong coding background from undergrad, coding was completely new to me. And I feel like every single week, the assignment just goes straight up into this week we're we're going to work on this type of statistical analysis or machine learning project using, say, certain libraries from Python or um, a, a different type of like uh, pipelines from based on coding. But for me, those are something really big and I had no foundations of. So even after finished at NYU, I feel like I got a little bit good knowledge of how in general data science uh, projects and data science world might look like. I still feel like I'm really missing the fundamental part. So that's why I feel like a book camp will give me more confidence, more solid milestones on understanding better and advancing a career later in this area. So that's why I think a book camps are always great choices because they are very beginner friendly and very open to people from all sorts of backgrounds um, as well as industries. So that's why after 
even coming out of the STEM field, I still think I can really benefit from doing a boot camp and learning a lot more from the basics and quickly build up to more advanced um, knowledges as well as the current um, very heat technologies, say in deep learning as well as machine learning. And you mentioned that um, you had a little bit of coding experience. What then was that admissions process like to get into the Flatiron School um, online data science bootcamp? Did you have to complete any kind of technical challenges or is it more just like a behavioral culture fit? Um, if I remember correctly, because that's been like a year <laughs> almost from now, um, I think the admission actually uh, admission process actually consists of two parts. One was like a quick Q and A interview with the admission officer, trying to understand my reasoning behind wanting to take the book camp at Flatiron, as well as some of my technical skills. And then they did share a link with me to do a quick um, sort of like technical statistical. Um, multiple choice, uh, multiple choice test to assess my basic knowledge in this field. Um, if I remember correctly, it wasn't something super challenging, but does consist of questions related to Python to coding logics, as well as basic stats. So um, I may say the admission process in general was very fast and uh, not super complicated, but also gave me a good uh, overview of what I can expect in a program, as well as feeling um, in general very friendly to people coming uh, out of like all kinds of industry and backgrounds and who are willing to come to here to just learn. And overall, what did the bootcamp curriculum cover? I really, it's it's probably a lot, but just off the top of your head, what did you learn? So Flatiron School really structured the curriculum really well. There were five modules in total. The first one started with more on basic data structures, you, uh, using um, Python libraries to work on data cleaning, formatting, um, as well as creating cool visualizations. Then in transiting to the second module, it was mostly focusing on statistical analysis, which is very key while in my current job, as well as I know a lot of job functions still dealing with data. It's a really important chunk for people to understand uh, what numbers are telling us, whether our surveys or research was a valid or a good approach. Um, then starting the third module, it was focusing on machine learning. And uh, the fourth module was deep learning. And deep learning consists of all kinds of uh, very new um, cutting edge technologies that we're facing, like recommendation systems, uh, deep neural network, um, as well as um, PCA and many other very interesting components. The last uh, module, it was um, just a project module. So everyone will be selecting a topic um, they're interested in either it's based on machine learning or one of the um, interesting deep learning technology and you pick a topic, build a project, and then we'll be presenting to the Flatiron instructor at the end. Um, that being said, actually each at the end of each module, so from module one to four, um, at the end of each one, we will be required to also do a project. It's, it can be either on a small group base or it can be individual base. And um, to be able to pass on to the next module, you have to pass that project. So that's kind of like a quick overview of the Flatiron curriculum. Wow. So that means that you built quite a portfolio in just that short time of the boot camp. I built probably like five, four or five projects, actually. Um, it was very interesting experiences. And also you got to meet people or within your uh, cohort and uh, they're just as excited and enthusiastic as you on the data world. And since you did end up doing this bootcamp part-time while working full-time, um, how did you end up juggling sort of the needs of your work during the daytime and then working um, at the bootcamp and finishing all of these projects? The good thing about my Flatiron cohort is usually uh, the instructor leads uh, workshops as well as going through lessons time. It's usually 
um, during like early evening or in the middle uh, or late afternoon. So it really works well for me like after I finish my work at the end of the day, I can literally switch to my personal computer and jump onto the workshop or the lessons uh, very quickly. Um, it's very easy to do it at home, of course. Um, and also with regards to working one-on-one -on -one with an instructor to talk about your projects or your struggle throughout uh, the module material, my instructor is very flexible and also she's actually in the same time zone as me so it's very easy for me to get that sorted out with her and uh, many times um, she definitely she comes from um, a different background similar to my background actually so she really understands some of the struggle on understanding certain data components certain projects or some of the module um, activities that related to either coding or stats or um, new uh, technology on machine learning. Um, so I found it very easy to, uh, very approachable. And in the meantime, uh, we do have like a very settled um, timeline on when should you be finishing the, um, the section of a certain module what you should be confident um, about after finishing the section. So it gives me a really good layout uh, to plan ahead of all my uh, course related activities while juggling between work and uh, you know online school. So I may say it's um, the pandemic helped <laughs> to juggle between those. And in the meantime, Flatiron does have a really good curriculum and schedule designed for students who can keep going. So Lavender, let's have you share your screen so that way we can walk through your project. So um, I was um, very excited when I got the opportunity to just build my own uh, project, choosing any technologies as well as data skills that I learned from Flatiron. And um, I choose to research on food security and um, infrastructure status, mostly focusing in the African region. So uh, I'll be going through my project in talking about why I picked this topic, the problem I want to solve, my modeling for the for security issue, as well as a um, dashboard that I built for showing infrastructure status and potentials. So a quick overview of my project. At the very beginning of the pandemic, many of us may witness the empty shelf in the grocery store, and that started to make me wonder about how's the food security issues, especially during the pandemic. And um, I know because it's a big global concern for years and years, so I was very curious about finding out what are some of the factors that might closely relate it to this subject matter. Um, and in the meantime, after doing all the modeling as well as research on this topic, I noticed that infrastructure can be another thing that's quite uh, closely related to this big topic and worldwide concern. So I decided to uh, visualize some of the data I'm able to collect through a really interesting geo, um, geospatial um, geospatial visualization on Streamlit. So let's begin with the problem I want to solve. So the first problem I'm looking into is doing a modeling, classification modeling specifically, uh, for security. Namely, looking at all kinds of different factors within the region that can contribute to um, predicting the first security level. So either the first security is at a critical level versus it is not. And second, I want to see the data that I collected if I'm able to build an interesting dashboard to contrast different regions within African area. Um, to start with, I will talk about the model selection. The problem type is a classification, namely, uh, usually people talk in uh, machine learning as a classifier. Some of the important predictors, so my x um, inputs, the dependent uh, variables are uh, the independent variables are time specific weather information, the infrastructure status, as well as social activities within the area. And um, some of those information, I actually uh, did web scraping directly from Google Earth Engine. But with regards to social activity, I actually got in touch with a third party organization related to either the UN World War Bank. And after communicating with them, they were able to share the data that I collected over the years. And my target, which is the y, a y variable, the dependent variable is the foot security class. So it's severe versus non-severe. And that data was collected from a organization called Early Family Network, which is under the World Bank umbrella. 
Um, so every month or sometimes seasonally, they publish reports as well as geospatial data sets on the food security classes based on the past several months. Um, it actually covers quite a few countries within the, uh, around the world, but many times within specific time frame, they may not cover all the countries. So there are definitely some missing data in that area. And the models that I started with included KNN, uh, random forest classifier, uh, Keras neural network, XGBoost, as well as logistic regression. And when I wrote down after working on hyperparameter tuning, working on modeling and tuning uh, all my models, the winners came down to um, random forest classifier as well as XGBoost classifier. And here are some of the quick results. So um, you can see they are actually very, very close to each other when it comes to accuracy, but XGBoost classifier is way less overfitting comparing to random forest. So I may say I do have a preference on the XGBoost classifier. In the meantime, uh, the recall is actually way higher on the XGBoost compared to random forest. So when I think about recall is I actually would value more if my classifier um, did a wrong prediction of an area that's actually not severe into a severe region rather than classifying an area that's very severe into a non-severe region. So that's why I will actually value recall a lot more um, from this model. And that's also another reason I picked the XGBoost classifier. So some of the strong predictors, you may wonder, um, the number one top one was actually social activities that are related to regional battles or reels. So very strong social conflicts within the area. And the second one that I looked it up was the night light infrastructure, which I think is a very good indicator of whether the transportation system is well connected and also if the food supply can be distributed even within time that we can there wasn't um, sun radiation. So namely, we can get food supplies um, spread it around the uh, area even within nighttime. So then we can get the food sources to the people who need it on time. And of course, there are a lot of weather related and climate related factors such, uh, such as a sensible heat net flux, as well as the soil moisture level was very strongly related to food security from a sense of, I think, uh, agricultural production, um, as well as harvesting seasons. Then after finishing up on the modeling part, I built a dashboard wanting to show people the overall current CDation as well as future need allocation on certain type of different resources. So here you can see is my dashboard. <laughs> um, so you can choose a base layer between OpenStreetMap and there are some other um, options that you can definitely show more clearly of how the satellite images look like. And you can pick an area between Northeast, Southern, Western and Central, Amer uh, Central Africa. Some of the indicators uh, or predictions you can be shown here would include um, health facility accessibility, ground travel speed is more related to transportation, solar and wind potentials are based on uh, the um, annual reports that's built by um, solar and wind map, which I believe are two organizations under either the UN or World Bank umbrella. And last but not the least, night light, which is a really important indicator actually mentioned in my modeling process. And the prediction part on social, uh, solar development needs and wind development needs are some of the calculation and predictors I um, build up myself based on the current solar and wind potential, electricity consumption and generation um, stage at um, different African region, what are some of the potential and needs that can be fulfilled by renewable energy. So uh, after finishing that prediction as well as calculation, I build up the indicator on this um, potential map. And also currently, this is also under maintenance uh, for myself because I wanted to demonstrate um, some more interesting uh, indicators that's related to directly on food security, as well as some of the research that I have done. So Lavender, what do you feel like the biggest challenge was in building this project? It seems like you got so much data from all kinds of resources. So I'm wondering if that was tricky or if there was something else that was even harder. 
Um, so the data process was definitely tricky of matching specifically um, all the regions. You have to make sure everything geolocated coded are actually on the same coordinating system and using the same type of projection, because otherwise you will be you will not be able to matching the data correctly. And uh, I have to thank my parents for that. My mom actually went to college for cartography. So this is technically her field as well. And sometimes having a little bit more discussion with her on choosing a better coordinate to project on say Africa or specifically other regions around the world. She may give me that expert knowledge on that, of course. And um, another thing is I actually started the project only looking at natural um, or geophysical um, factors. So namely the climate, um, some of the landscape as well as the weather data without thinking much about the side of social, social activities. And at the beginning, actually, the model wasn't predicting very strongly. So I started to think about what are some other factors that I can look into before go too deep into the hyperparameter tuning, because many times uh, tuning may only increase the model by very small percentage um, at my current level. So I think there must be some, something else that I can look into. And I got in touch with a professor that I studied with uh, from my undergrad because she has researched on food security for years. One of the other things she mentioned was related to social activities in the area, as well as infrastructure level, because she said many times we are able to produce enough food resources to be shared around the world. But however, because of transportation, because of current um, activities uh, either related to political or social conflicts in the area actually was um, preventing some of the food um, distribution and she said look into that it might be a really good resource and um, i was able to got in contact with a third party uh, organization in order to get the data working on this project and also script more um, interesting factors from google earth engine in order to actually improve my model by a lot um, i think it was probably around like 20 to 30 percent. So I think some of the outside data resources and getting to talk to experts really helped me in this. So yeah, um, I may say the challenge first came from, you know, structuring the data set. And second was also thinking outside the box about what are some other data sources you can look into to make this model more comprehensive and robust. Did you end up using a lot of what you learned during the bootcamp at Flatiron to build this whole dashboard and sort of reason out and do the concepts for this? Or did you have to learn actually new concepts or any new tools in order to build this? Um, so the dashboard itself on Streamlit is definitely a new thing to me. And um, that wasn't actually covered in the Flatiron curriculum because um, I think this is probably one of the relatively newer uh, Python library or um, online uh, services that you can use. So, um, but I actually got the idea of using Streamlit from my instructor. She introduced that to me um, and um, she was also very great about looking up other resources that I can push my dashboard into live so people can play around with it. So um, even though it wasn't covered in the curriculum, but my awesome instructor, Amber, was able to provide me with extra resources on what kind of tools that I can use to build my project and also give me some good guidance about um, some resources to look up online and some cool blocks that people have done similar things where I can refer to so I can end up building the dashboard step by step. So Lavender, do you anticipate using this capstone project that you built at Flatiron for any future data science interviews? Um, definitely, of course, um, because that's the project that I've been spending quite a lot of time on um, and doing also some research actually outside just the data world to learn more about the subject, learn more about geospatial uh, visualizations, um, the geomatics part, as well as learning just about food security and some other um, interesting factors in the African region. So um, I think it was a really great experience and I've, I have actually talked about this project through some of the job interviews I already got and um, it seems like I, I feel more confident talking about this project as I actually build it from scratch 
utilizing data sets that I script entirely myself from the Google Earth Engine, as well as getting in touch with organization who can provide the data. So yes, this is definitely a highlight that I may always want to talk about during interviews or some of my data science experiences. And since you were completing this boot camp while also working full time, um, have you been using what you've learned at Flatiron School on the job, both during the boot camp and then also since you've graduated? Actually, yes. So recently, I was able to get new uh, projects to work on related to my current job. And uh, some of the work that I did focus on doing statistical analysis on energy efficiency and performances uh, between certain years, as well as after finishing retrofit programs. So I actually utilized some of the statistical knowledge that I uh, studied at Flatiron in order to um, build it upon my project at work. Also, uh, there were modeling machine learning related um, small project pilots uh, happening at work I was able to participate on and um, some of the knowledge that I learned from Flatiron as well as based on experiences I had um, building data science project at Flatiron, I was able to uh, think outside the framework and see if I can add in extra data to improve my model. We're utilizing some other types of resources like new libraries, new machine learning algorithms in order to improve it. So I'd say, yeah, a lot of things I learned from Flatiron as well as the experience I got doing Flatiron projects were really helpful. Do you recommend that other people who are working already in data consider going to a data science boot camp um, like Flatiron School? What can be like the benefits of doing something like that for a career? Um, I would definitely recommend it because, um, you know, keep learning, keep your motivation in an industry is always a really key in building up an advanced career, I may say. So um, I know a lot of industries right now are looking into automation, utilizing data for um, optimization, and um, especially using modeling to do better predictions on either it can be energy generation, the forecast of weather, or um, any anything else we can think about. So I think it's a great time to build more skills in this um, data science bootcamp uh, through data science bootcamp. And on the other side, that people who are already working in data um, industry, if they have a strong background in data science from either grad school or uh, college, it's definitely great. Um, on the other side, I think uh, bootcamp, it's always like a good refresher to see what are some of the new things you can get onto, as well as meeting new people um, who have different ideas from in a different industry, um, and as well as being benefited from an instructor about, you know, new cutting edge technologies, new algorithms are releasing. And um, of course, the, uh, the career development is another thing that I think Flatiron was really great about. My last question for you is, do you have any advice for incoming part-time data science bootcamp students? Is there anything that you wish you knew before day one? One thing I may say is definitely utilizing the time that you're at the school to make most of, out of it. So prepare in advance um, for the study, for your study um, schedule. And in the meantime, always dive a little bit more into the content so you can learn way more on different things. And on the other side, uh, throughout doing interviews uh, as well as more on technical assessments, I noticed that even in the data science field, uh, many times people are looking at your understanding on the data structure. Um, how do you um, build scripts that can uh, that can actually save space and time complexity. So this is an area I wish I actually dive more into during my time at Flatiron, but it's an area that I didn't have a, a lot of like capacity on way back. So I may say people who are entering like a book camp, definitely don't forget about the real uh, world, uh, real world technical assessment, how they can be like and build upon your skills more accordingly. But of course, um, many industries, when they do a technical assessment or when they focus on their day to day, it can be really different. So I had assessments that's mostly focusing on, you know, um, your skills on data structure and some of the simple questions and see how can you utilize Python to write very, uh, you know, simple script that can uh, extract the data in a really fast manner 
where some can be focusing on machine learning. So I may say be mindful of some of the different real world skills needed is very important uh, while you're still studying at, fly, uh, studying at a book camp. That's an excellent place to wrap up this capstone project spotlight. Um, thank you so much, Lavender, for walking us through your project that you built in just a few weeks. It's such a comprehensive, really amazing model. Um, and best of luck in your career. So we will be posting a recording and a transcript of this video interview with Lavender on the Course Report blog with contact information for Flatiron School, just in case you're interested in applying for one of their upcoming cohorts. And thanks so much to all of you for watching. Tweet at us, email us, let us know what topic you'd like us to cover next on the Course Report blog. And in the meantime, you can follow Course Report on Facebook and Twitter. And if you're a bootcamp alumni, don't forget to post a review of your own bootcamp experience on Course Report. Your review is a huge help to anyone thinking of getting into tech today.